So thank you everybody for turning up. Um, and um, we've got a, one or two things I have to say at the beginning. So can I remind everyone to keep your background noise to a minimum, please, and to only speak one person at a time and not to speak over the top of other people. Please mute your microphones when you're not speaking and then unmute when I invite you to speak. <laughs> please indicate if you wish to speak by using the chat facility on Zoom by typing MIS, which means for those of you who don't know, may I speak? And I'll call you to speak in turn. And please also type your name in the chat so that we have a record of who's attending. So this meeting, just so you know, will be recorded and placed on the council's YouTube channel so that people can view it afterwards if they wish. If you do not wish to appear, turn off your video, okay? So we've received apologies from High Littleton Parish Council um, and Councillor Liz Hardman. So we now uh, start. The first thing I need to ask you, as this is our AGM, um, are there, is there anyone else here who um, would like to put forward a nomination for the chair or vice chair position, please? No, no. Okay, then, right. Well, thank you for that. And so we'll start the meeting proper now. And so I would like to welcome Mohamed Asusi, uh, who is the Health Improvement Officer for Danes, to give a quick update on the active travel social prescribing, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, th welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Mohamed Asusi, Health Improvement Officer at Baines. Uh, I joined my position one month ago uh, to lead on the Active Travel Social Prescribing Hub. Um, you may know um, that we have received the funding uh, for the three years pilot project in the Somer Valley area. I'll be quick, so uh, just uh, to let the to let everyone know just uh, that we are going uh, to do some engagement uh, in the next period. So we are going to talk to people in the Summer Valley area, local organization about our project and try to understand what are the, what are the enablers and the barriers to this, uh, to this active travel social prescribing hub. Basically, uh, the hub will be uh, like a one-stop shop uh, for people in the Summer Valley area to come and uh, have cycling activities, uh, walking activities, we will be uh, procuring uh, many providers uh, to do these activities and the goal is to to move uh, to let people uh, know that active travel and um, that they have a lot of ability in the summer valley area to be more active to more to be more physically active and then to 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 be less reliant on cars um, this will hit our target in terms of uh, climate uh, emergency as well as help gp surgeries uh, the pcn in, uh, in the area in order to um, free up a bit uh, the service and try to look for innovative ways uh, for people in order to uh, get uh, more physically active and then uh, reduce their reliance on the day-to-day -day, uh, NHS services. Um, this is for now the project we are trying now to mobilize the project, try to meet with people from uh, different uh, backgrounds and meet, their, uh, meet the service users of uh, different organizations. And as I told you, I will be in touch uh, soon in order to um, organize some focus groups with uh, with people, uh, especially with learning disabilities, people with a low uh, with mental health issues, uh, people with long term conditions. Try to understand the landscape and then uh, take it from there in order to uh, be appropriately uh, to appropriately um, manage this project. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Right. That's lovely. Thank you for that. That sounds really interesting. I would be very pleased to hear a bit more about that. So uh, we'll hope to hear from you. That's great. Thank right you. then. Um, any questions on that? Right. Can we uh, ask Miriam Warner from the Summer Valley Rediscovered project uh, to give us a brief update, please? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Miriam Wilner from the Summer Valley Rediscovered Project. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update tonight. I presented back, I presented um, to the forum back in March about the, the work that we were doing with 
Bradstock Town Council, Midsummer Norton Town Council and Westfield Parish Council around um, the green spaces of Hayden Batch, Waterside Valley, uh, Midsummer Norton Town Park and Willowbrook Walk. Um, I and I said at the time that we were looking to make a bid to uh, to, to WECA for funding. Um, so we submitted a bid, a bid to the Green Recovery Fund back in July. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we found out on Monday that we've been successful with that funding bid. So that's bringing in um, approximately £1.3 million uh, for a three year project to carry out um, uh, um, nature recovery projects so that's um, habitat management work um, grassland restoration woodland restoration um, there'll be access um, improvements money for access improvements so new paths um, and work to the entrances of the green spaces and it also funds a, um, a, a wide-ranging community engagement um, program so volunteering opportunities um, events and activities at the green spaces um, and also green social prescribing so it links in quite well um, really well actually with with the um, active travel social prescribing um, work so we'll be working really closely with uh, Mohammed um, on on that and it's great actually the, the two projects are going to run concurrently over three years so um, lots of opportunities to have a really great program of green social prescribing in the area um, I'll pop my email address in the chat um, so that if anyone wants to find out more, then um, just um, yeah, drop me a line and really happy to talk. And apologies that I can't stay for the whole of the meeting, I'm afraid, so I will disappear off in a little while. <laughs> That's all right. We all know how yeah. manic life can be, yes. Um, yeah, it was quite interesting because I read the information you sent to uh, our clerk in Midsummer Norton. So um, that was, it's really nice to know about that. Uh, thank you very much for coming and telling us and for, well, organizing everything. It's really nice. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. You can pop off if you need to. Yeah. Now. Yeah, I'll just just um, break all the rules in person. I'd like to thank Miriam. I'm a, I'm a councillor, as you know, in uh... Westfield. Yeah. Oh, Westfield. Yeah. Sorry. Um, She's done a magnificent job and her team. It's just fantastic how well this has gone. She's she knows the right people. She sent the right stuff. Thank you, Miriam. I can't thank you enough. You're very welcome. <laughs> yes. Right then, I think um, over to you for the next bit. If you're uh, all set, Ron. Yes, I am indeed, Chair. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Ron Hopkins. I'm the Vice Chair currently of Summer Valley Forum. Um, and on the agenda, I'm introducing this item, which is in two parts. Um, and we're going to talk about the uh, local plan and health and wellbeing strategy. And um, then we'll move on to developing living livable neighbourhoods. But um, at this moment, I'd like to call on Simone de Beer, an old friend of mine and a very good guy. It was very short a time, I understand, so I won't waste any more of it. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Simone de Beer, the Head of Planning in Baines. I'm here with my colleague, Nancy Towers. Do you want to introduce yourself, Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy. I'm the Health and Wellbeing Strategy Officer at Baines. We're going to do a double act because the Council is preparing a number of long-term strategies. Uh, and the ones we want to talk to you about are the new local plan and the health and wellbeing strategy. Um, I think Alison's going to beam a presentation for us. Is that, have I caught you in a way, Alison? Are we expecting to present for us? <clears throat> so these these two, we, we're bringing these together because they are closely linked. These two these two initiatives from the council, and they're both closely focused on improving people's lives, and they share common outcomes around things like um, uh, homes, provision of homes, where we, we move, jobs, provision of jobs, tackling climate change, uh, and we want to work with the communities. Um, as we develop them, as we really value feedback. And this is just the start of the process. So at the very beginning, we want to come and speak to you about um, these two initiatives. Uh, we, we've got a few slides, and that is, I think your slides are first. Yeah. And, I got to see, and then we want to really open up the discussion because we, we, we don't want to say too much. We really want to hear what, what you've got to say. So we'll just um, present a few slides and then we'll move on to a wider discussion. Alison, I think we're on slide um, three already, I think, three or four. 
Next slide. Next slide. That's brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the health and well-being strategy today. Um, so just to give a bit of context, um, almost every aspect of our lives impacts our health and well-being and how long we'll live. So this includes our jobs, our homes, access to education and public transport. And we know in Bath and North East Somerset, we know that lives are being cut short and people who live in certain areas are dying earlier than they should. So there is, um, in some areas, there's up to a 10 year um, difference in terms of life expectancy. Um, Alison, next slide, thank you. Um, so we know that we need to get the right building blocks in place so everyone in our community can thrive. So all these different things impact on our health and well-being from our work, transport, family, friends, housing, education, food, the money and resources that we have and our surroundings as well as the environment that we live in. Um, and I suppose we know that in some areas we perhaps haven't got the building blocks quite right. So for the health and wellbeing strategy, we really want to look at what the different needs are around health and wellbeing um, in different areas in Baines. Next slide, please. Um, so, for example, just um, to give you an idea of how housing can impact our health and well-being, we know um, in our area that the cost of housing is high and there are relatively low wages, so it makes it difficult for people to be able to afford decent homes. And if you're living in an overcrowded conditions or um, housing that can't be heated properly or ventilated properly, it can lead to mold and which can affect people's health um, in terms of respiratory illness, but also there's that stress that um, of living in those conditions that can also impact your health and well-being, lower your immune system and mean that you become ill more frequently. So we know all these different aspects really do can impact our health and well-being. Um, next slide. So um, just to explain why um, the strategy is important, um, it sets out the vision for what we want to achieve for health and well-being in our area. It identifies the key priorities for improving health and well-being. It drives and influences the delivery of health and social care and provides an integrated framework that allow, aligns with other local strategies. So we seek to target the priorities that will reduce health inequalities and support all to live health and well healthy and well lives and we really want to engage with local partners and communities to ensure that your local needs are being met next slide so this is just a snapshot of how we're approaching the development of the strategy we're at the left hand side um, so we're really seeking the views of residents um, um, taking into account kind of evidence and um, data from the NHS and councils um, and also seeking the input from local organisations and businesses to feed into the priorities for the strategy and we'll also be feeding that into the local plan to steer that preparation. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, so really, in essence, to get it right, we really need to hear from you to know what um, the issues are that you feel with your um, health and well-being in your area. Um, we are launching a survey tomorrow that will be open until the end of October. So um, we'd really encourage you to um, complete that and share that with colleagues and friends um, to get their feedback and um, inf um, information as well. Um, next slide. Um, so yes, it's really about what has the most impact on your health and well-being in, in Summer Valley. Um, I've just dropped our email in there on the slides, so um, you can contact myself and um, my manager, Fidelia Richardson, via that email address. But I'll hand, I'll hand back to Simone now to talk more about the local plan. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Could we have the next slide, please, and the one after that? <laughs> So linked with the health and well-being strategy, many of you will know that the, the Baines is now doing um, a, a new local plan. Uh, and you may ask yourself, we haven't quite finished the local plan partial update uh, while we're doing a new local plan. And uh, the partial update was just a, a bridge to, to give us to, to, to update some of the key policies um, whilst we did, well, until we began a new local plan. So you'll be aware that we come to the end of the, of the local plan partial update process. Uh, that's the, the main modifications coming out of the examination. And those are going out to consultation. But really, the focus today for us is, is, is to let you know that we're going to be launching the beginning of the new local plan in October. And it's, it's a key tool, the local plan, for, for setting the agenda on place shaping, 
and development. So a lot of the issues coming out of uh, Nancy was describing in the health and well-being strategy will be picked up by the local plan. So alongside these two documents, we've addressed many of the issues of concern of residents. I think I need to point out that uh, you may be asking what's happened to the West of England spatial development strategy, which was under preparation. What's happened? And then um, we covered that, so South Gloss, Bristol and Baines couldn't reach agreement on the, on the final document. So the mayor, who's responsible for preparing the SDS, the Spatial Development Strategy, has halted that work, which means that the, that the three authorities need to progress policies, strategic policies, through local plans. Uh, so even a greater need for Baines to progress its local plan. It is the document which development and new proposals and land changes land use changes need to accord with it's really key that Baines has the right plan in place to make sure that spatial development and planning applications are determined in a way which meets the council's objectives and our community's objectives it's um it, it's, it's a new plan it's a long-term plan so you've got the scope now to be ambitious it's very hard to see what the world's going to be like in 20 years time who knows really but that's the time horizon we, we need to plan for so we can do our best and I think that's really improved by working with communities who know their areas, who understand their places, and we can get a steer from you in terms of, of, of any changes forthcoming and how those changes can be. We can make sure those changes happen in a positive way. And it's really critical that, as I said before, we link with the health and wellbeing strategy and the economic strategy and those kind of key um, plans that the council is preparing in conjunction with communities. Next slide, please. Now to drive the preparation of the, of the local plan, um, Bain's members have given us, the cabinet has given us four, four key priorities uh, and these won't be a surprise to you I don't think and these can be moulded and adjusted as we progress through but we do need to be very clear as of prioritising what's going to be the real drivers in formulating policies and, a, and spatial strategy for Baines. So, so, so no big surprise, responding to the challenge of the climate emergency and uh, net zero targets, maximising delivery of affordable housing, um, and making sure that the kind of housing that comes forward responds to what we need, as opposed to just what the development industry may seek to, to, to provide. We need to really focus on um, protecting and enhancing nature and biodiversity and again, and that's why I'm really pleased to see we're working in conjunction with uh, what Miriam's doing, uh, and then creating the opportunity for sustainable development, particularly in terms of jobs, the right kind of jobs which are the green jobs, the kind of jobs which are, help us deliver the climate emergency, but making sure we have the right space for those jobs in the right places to help businesses grow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that there are other requirements on the local plan process. So the council and our communities have our own priorities and we'll seek to um, discuss those priorities with the communities, but we still need to be looking at maintaining housing land supplies required by um, government. There's issues around um, coming out of the national policy we need to adhere to. I won't go through all of those, but it's alongside those four priorities, there are things which some of those are more of a challenge for us to do, and you'll be aware from, from the past, those who've been involved in plan making previously, some of those, those requirements are quite challenging, particularly under housing issues, but we'll, we'll work with our communities as we go through the, pro the process of preparing the plan. Next slide, please. Um, so, what, we what we're hoping, we're planning to do is, is to work with the communities through a series of workshops. So it says the, 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 the local plan process is being launched and this is going to be part of the launch. It'll be launched in October. So you've got an, an early site, an early um, notice of the launch. The next key stage will be workshops with town and parish councils. And those will be towards the end of this year, beginning of, of next year. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be writing to you to arrange those, making arrangements to, to holding those across the different planning forum areas. And the, the, it's a two-parter, so that stage one, first part, it, it, the, the purpose of it is to help identify the key issues and key priorities which you think relate to your areas. What really concerns you? What do you think is really beneficial about your places? What concerns you? Are, what trends are going in the wrong direction? And we've heard some of the health ones today from Nancy, but there are others. So we need to first identify those. And then secondly, we'll come back to you in June, July, middle of next year, beginning to think, well, what sort of options can we put in place in terms of the new local plan to respond to those and deliver those four priorities, which members have given us in Baines. 
And that will all feed then into a formal local plan options consultation towards the end of next year. We're required to do this kind of um, uh, formal consultation. It is quite helpful because it'll be a chance to be in the same place at the same time, see where we've got to. And the outcome of that consultation will then feed into the draft plan which gets published and goes to examination. So we're going to be writing to Town and Parish Councils fairly soon, just really sitting out and asking you how you want to engage. You've engaged in different ways previously, so directly from the parishes, you may have a parish working group, you may want to use your neighbourhood planning group. There's various different ways, um, and it, it does um, just to help you organise yourselves. And then what role do you want to play? In the past, some authorities really just responded to what the councils presented to them. Some parish councils have actually done quite a bit of work. So in the previous plan, some of the parish councils um, we, we provided the resources and the training and they did local assessments, lo local character assessments, <coughs> excuse me, landscape assessments, even to the point of considering housing sites. So looking at the options for, for housing growth, where housing was appropriate and, and choosing themselves, which they thought was the most appropriate housing site. So there's different degrees, depending on your resources and, and your local, um, where you set up locally, there's different roles, levels of roles you could play in the new local plan. And then also we'll want to have a conversation around the role of the new of your local plans and the new local plan because um, the new local plan once adopted will have implications for some areas. You may want to update your, your existing neighbourhood plans. There may be a need for new local plans in those areas which don't have neighbourhood plans. That's a conversation we'll, we'll, we'll have with you and discuss with you and, and um, try and get to the most appropriate outcome. I think we're on the last, near the last slide or two, Alison. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the current planning policy framework for the Summer Valley area. The approach taking the local plan, this is what's being reviewed in terms of the new local plan and setting a new policy framework. The existing one sought to constrain housing growth in light of the issues around the lack of um, sufficient work opportunities for the, local, for, for the local workforce and the high levels of out commuting. Uh, the, the focus really was on consolidating existing growth that existed and we know we've had growth uh, since then, unexpected growth from the Mendip side, which hasn't been particularly helpful and we weren't able to resist that. But um, we need to review that. Is that still the right approach? Do the communities want to see some growth in the areas? And if so, how much growth? Or is it still, uh, still a need for consolidation? It needs to be a big there was a big focus on green infrastructure, and I think that's been exacerbated and, and um, enhanced by the work that Miriam's doing. I, the, I think we need to invest in the town centres. So in terms of the existing policy sought to invest in the town, it's focused only on two town centres, and I think that's an issue for some parts of the, of the, of the Summer Valley area. Um, the existing plan sought to protect employment sites because of the value of employment. I mean, we're marginally successful in that, but also provide new employment and you'll be aware of some of the new sites and some of the existing estates which still have some expansion opportunities. So that's the existing plan. You can see for yourself, I can send you a link to the existing planning policy. Um, we wanted to think to next because we did quite a bit of talking. So, um, as in, if you go to the last slide, this is a slide really for both Nancy and I. We wanted to want to really hand over to you and have a discussion around. We've given some issues, some evidence, some information, some of our views, and what we think are perhaps some of the issues that we need to be responding to in the health and well-being strategy and the local plan. We put down there what we think are our um our other key issues around employment, the lack of employment opportunities and, and still the ongoing out, um, high out commuting, the skills issue, um, the, the issues around affordability of new housing, the, the need to increase biodiversity in transport, the poor links with Bristol, Bristol and Bath. Um, as Nancy's spoken about the health and unequal outcomes, issues around the town centres, the need for improvement, the scope to, to increase renewable energy, making sure infrastructure is aligned with new development, opportunities for local food production and, and also making sure the villagers have a full say in what happens in the new local plan. So that, that's really, that's not a definitive list. We've just put together what we think is a useful list. What we'd like to do now, for the rest of the time, is really hand over to you and for you to, um, we may have got those wrong, there'll be additional ones, we have got the emphasis wrong, really just to hear what you've got to say, um, Chair. So Alison, if you wouldn't mind stop, uh, if you wouldn't mind stopping the presentation so we can open up the discussion. Ron, I think you're on mute. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you, Simon, very much for that. Um, it's a very complex subject and um, something which is difficult to take in at a glance. Um, 
good to see the workshops are coming up. Um, uh, I don't know what the rest of the panelists here think about uh, or have any got any views to say at this stage, but we would certainly welcome the opportunity to uh, in, involve ourselves in a um, workshop session because it that that does give people the chance to think about responses uh, beforehand. But uh, tonight, let's hear what everybody's got to say if you want to. Anybody got any points? There's a hand up, Richard Burgess. Yes, Richard. Thank you very much for that. It, yeah, a, a couple of thoughts, if I may. Um, the biggest issue that sort of been identified them on the end there has been education and healthcare. So we find because we're on the Amendip and Baines border here, Chilcontum is quite a good example. A lot of people in that area, there'll be prospective property developers such as the Gladwells of this year, uh, this world, they'll leaflet shot the area. And the main concern that residents have is, is that if you want to build in this area, will there be appropriate healthcare and educational facilities brought on to support that additional amount of residents in this area? And secondly, and I accept you've identified this as well, with a lack of bus drivers and bus, bus services in particular being cut, if there are residents that are looking to actually commute to the baths of this world, what can you offer them in terms of improved infrastructure to do that? Uh, Ron, do you want to pick the notes up as we go along or? <laughs> I, think, I think it would be, I think for the purposes of this meeting, it would be useful for Alison or somebody to make a note of a few of these things in key points and ask uh, for some sort of uh, formal response from Baines, uh, because um, they're big questions. Richard's got a very good point. A lot of people in this area are very concerned about um, capacity of health care services and so on. But I don't expect people to give an answer to something which is fundamental to thousands of people's lives over the over the air like this instantaneously. So please let's respond to you either in terms of our minutes or as, as in a response for, uh, from an email from the chair or uh, via Alison to you. Thank you, Ron. I've, I've put my I'm put my question in the comments as well, so it can be picked up from there. OK, yeah. OK, any other questions? Anybody? Anybody's hands up? Anybody asking for a chat? And then I would like to speak, if that's all right, Ron. Oh, OK. Go ahead, Eleanor. Yes, I'm I'm rather concerned. Um, I mean, thank it's very helpful first of all, to have an integrated plan between the health and education side of things and the housing development, local plan, spatial side of things. And the point Richard has made is exactly the point that we and Westfield Parish Council have been making about the developments in Mendip. So first question is, are we consulting, collaborating with Mendip? because that has a huge impact on our facilities in Baines. Secondly, I thought we were only at the stage of calling for sites, and yet there was a blue square on that last map, which fills me with alarm, because it would appear to be Bath College. You're not, you aren't surely already planning to put housing on the site of Bath College. I would have expected the square to be the other side of the road for the development of the Radco site. So I'm, I'm unclear why we already have sites indicated on that slide when as far as I understood it, you were asking us or presumably the developers will all gallop in with um, sites. And thirdly, can you take on board the importance of transport to link the villages. It's great having an arterial run like the A367, even if that is designed for Roman chariots and not for modern vehicular traffic, but it's important that people living in Kilmerston, Tining, you know, Shoshkam, Welton, all the small villages don't have to depend on their cars to get to work. So there you are, three for the price of one. Come on, can I just add? Can I just add something to what Ernest said? It might be useful if you could send 
out a copy of that map separately to the presentation so people can see exactly what you what 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 uh, what you've got in mind for development and so on um and I'm of, go sorry. ahead yes sorry could just clarify something um that map is an extract from the existing adopted plans so there's not any proposals there and ellen is ellen is completely right we're not proposing anything in the state even before we've put pen to paper we want to have these conversations with the local communities. So, Ellen, I can reassure you that's just the existing local which you may be may be familiar with. Uh, we have, we, we, we are um, issuing a call for sites, um, but we, we're not making any proposals yet. That's just purely and, and those those are, all those blobs on that map are the existing allocations that you'll be familiar with, sort of protecting employment sites primarily or um, designating new new sites. But there's nothing there that that would be any surprise to you. If I can just clarify that to reassure you. Okay, well, that's a reasonable argument. Um, do we have access to that map, do you know, um, at the parish level? I, I'm happy to send it. It, it. it is online. I can send you a link it online as the adopted yeah, local yeah. plan, the Soma Valley, Valley chapter, but um, I'm happy to send it separately as part of the presentation, just so you can see. Yeah, it'll be useful, I think, for everybody. Um, there's that. And uh, I'd like to uh, obviously say that the local plan has great concerns about health, and it's been linked now to well-being and so on. Um, bearing in mind, if you look at the map you've provided, that map's proving to be a rather talking point. Um, you'll see that a lot of the a lot of the, the infrastructure is linked by main roads, which are already two-lane and full of heavy vehicles. And um, I'm frankly horrified at the idea about um, people cycling and walking. Uh, and pushing uh, wheelchairs along the A367, um, unless it's improved or changed dramatically. So we won't go into that, but let's let's see your proposals out to the parishes. And um, is anybody got anything else to say at this stage on that? Okay, well, in, in that case, Simon and, and Nancy, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. I'd like to move on now to part two. Uh, which is developing livable neighbourhoods, which is what I was just speaking about. And I'd like to introduce um, Ashley Baton, who's the project manager, and Joanne Sammons, assistant transport planning, and Claire Graham, behavioural change team leader, Baines. So are they there? Thanks, Ron. Um, that, that, Sorry, that's, yeah. that's very kind of you. Um, Claire's not with us tonight. She's um, she's double booked, so she's doing another event for us tonight. Okay. So uh, so it's just myself and Joe, but um, hopefully we can uh, we can manage. Um, Alison, will you be doing the slides, or do you want me to do it? I don't mind either way. Uh, thank you ever so much. Um, this uh, is obviously, uh, as Ron says, about livable neighbourhoods. Um, I have to say, I think it very much ties in with what Mohammed was talking about earlier in terms of. Uh, uh, active travel. Uh, what Simone was just talking around in terms of planning policy around movement uh, and also what Nancy was talking about in terms of surroundings as well. So um, we are in a bit of a theme here, I think. Um, um, but let me talk through it and, 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 and see what your thoughts are. Um, before we get cracking, um, I am mindful that the imagery in this, um, in this side pack is, is rather urban. Um, and the reason for that is that generally, and I'll come to this in one of the slides really, livable neighbourhoods to date have been a very urban thing. Um, but we are doing some work here in Baines to do livable neighbourhoods elsewhere. I'm also aware that in, in the Summer Valley area, when we put forward a request for applications before I started on this programme, uh, but Joe, Joe was around, I think, Joe, um, there were um, some applications put forward um, in the area at Pease Down, uh, I think Farrington, Gurney and Timsbury, um, which if, if well, we, which we're not taking forward in this current phase, um, but will, um, will be something that, again, I guess we can consider again in a sort of next phase of, 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 of livable neighbourhoods when that, when that comes forward. Um, so I'm going to focus very much on this phase, um, what we're doing at the moment, um, and it might whet your appetite for some further applications for livable neighbours, as I say, um, on top of those three that I've just mentioned, um, when, the, when, when maybe a round um, of applications are called for, um, for a sort of phase two. Uh, so, um, Alison, if I could have the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. In terms of what I'll talk about, 
Um, what are livable neighbourhoods? Why do we need them? Um, where are those first ones that we're talking about? Um, for, those, for, for that first phase of livable neighbours, what we've achieved so far, um, where we are at the moment in the process um, and, and what will happen next. And then if there's any questions, we can, we can hopefully take those at the end. Um, I don't mind if people want to dive in uh, with a question as we go through, um, but I'll leave Ron, Ron as chair to sort of uh, manage that through, if that's all right, Ron. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So in terms of what are livable neighbourhoods, typically what we're trying to do is, is reallocate road space. So there's kind of a fairer spread. Um, cars have a little bit taken over in, in a lot of areas, and a lot of areas both uh, in urban and in, and in rural settings. And it's about just trying to achieve that, that rebalance, really. Um, so we're looking at sort of movement in terms of better active travel uh, or, or more ability for people to do active travel. But also this other part, which uh, I think, again, we've touched on with some of these other, other presentations uh, so far this evening, you know, around healthier, pleasant, more pleasant places. So these schemes aren't just about traffic interventions. I think this is a really important point. And it's something that we've learned, Joe, haven't we, very quickly as we've been gone through this programme. It's not just about traffic interventions, which is, I think is where historically it's come from. It's more holistic than that. And it's not only traffic, it's aimed at improving health and well-being as well. So again, very much tying in with the other agendas that we've, 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 we've seen already this evening. Uh, next slide, please, Alison, if that's all right. Um, in terms of achieving that, how do we do that? Um, we're looking at uh, uh, things like wider pavements, uh, drop curves, so people can move uh, across that roadway uh, uh, easier, uh, dedicated lanes for cycling, um, modal filters, vehicle traffic restrictions um, on occasion, uh, achieved in various ways. Um, and then as part of all of this, as I've just said, you know, improvements in social spaces and potentially, if it's appropriate, um, looking at the way residence parking schemes are, are in the area, perhaps extending, amending or, or improving those. So lots of ways that we can achieve livable neighbourhoods. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Thanks. Um, we're not doing this on our own. Uh, this is very much a community led programme. It's very much aligned to our uh, climate and ecological emergency objectives. So one of our key metrics, for example, as the program is, is around what we're doing to achieve uh, reductions in car trips. Um, again, in terms of biodiversity, what are we doing as a program in terms of delivering against that biodiversity objective that we have? Um, very much being proposed and led by communities. I'll come to that in a bit more detail as we go through. Um, and they're not new, but I think we are doing them a slightly different way, as I said earlier. I think they've moved on now from being very traffic focused. They're much more holistic in their approach. And they are about creating, as, as I said, you know, these healthier spaces um, where people can perhaps get out more and feel more comfortable in that sort of, um, in, in, you know, in that public realm setting. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, we need them. Uh, we've touched on some of these points, so I'll just, I'll just run through them. We need them because uh, often the amount of cars that we have on the road network are discouraging people from doing other things, uh, like walking, cycling, and potentially wheeling. Um, we need to do these because we have these climate and ecological emergencies. Um, we have this desire to improve health, quite rightly, improve air quality, um, and reduce the impact of vehicle emissions. Um, and I think this is also an important sort of point, this final point. Um, often those people who are the most vulnerable, and we saw this when, uh, so I was leading on the Clean Air Zone project as well, you know, often these people um, uh, that are most heavily impacted by uh, things like air pollution, for example, um, are the people who've got often the less heard voices. Um, so I think there's an, all, there's an important point there um, uh, when we come to LMs, and we're doing a lot of work to make sure that we're hearing all the voices in the communities that we're working with, um, not just those who are perhaps the most engaged or the most vocal. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, I don't think we're, we're trying to be in any way, shape or form anti-car. Um, that has been uh, a label that some of these programmes have suffered from, I think. Um, but I think what we're saying is that it's more that the car will not dominate um, and trying to get that rebalancing back that we touched on earlier. Um, this, just to touch on this graphic on the right hand side, um, you know, we're talking about electric cars now. Some people are talking about autonomous vehicles. You know, all these vehicles still take up the same amount of space. You know, so we really do have to look. We've, we've only got a fixed amount of road infrastructure. 
that we, we that we can unless we start going on a, a big road building program, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, but in most uh, environments, we've got a fixed road infrastructure, um, and and we need to work with that as much as we can um, to allow people to move around um, safely and to get where they want to do, uh, where, get where they want to go promptly uh, as well. You know, and and spreading that around uh, across bus, coach, cycle, car, rather than the car itself just dominating, um, I think is again part of that rebalancing that we're looking for. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can do some some work on the uh, uh, infrastructure. We can do infrastructure improvements, um, but I think there's other things that that people can do. Um, people at the end of the day have a ch choice. Um, they can do things differently. And I think, again, part of this program is not only what we can do with the infrastructure, but it's helping people and supporting people through the work that Claire's doing with her behavior change team to make a change as well. Um, so that they're traveling less, consuming less, which is all helping against our, our climate emergency objectives. And also, I think this is a really important point. If people are going to get in the car um, or, or make those journeys, that they're also thinking about the others that they're impacting when they're doing it. So thinking about where they're driving, um, are they rat running through someone's neighborhood? Could they perhaps go a different way? You know, and also thinking about how they're driving. You know, are they driving in a way that makes it feel safe for other people who might want to walk and cycle to do so? Um, so I think that's a really important point and one that's you know, quite big on in the program. Again, going, building on that holistic kind of approach. Um, we can adapt if we want to. I think uh, Claire works hard on that, you know, in terms of pushing that message that we can, we have got choices, we can make these changes if we want to. Um, and I think we can, we can be very surprised that, you know, a little change can make a big difference. Um, I don't think, you know, if I said that, if I said that if we took one or two trips a week definitely, uh, just say in Bath itself, um, and everyone did that, we're taking 20% of the traffic out the, you know, if it was two trips a week, we're taking 20% of the traffic out, out the network, we've lost rush hour, you know. So whilst we're doing a lot with the infrastructure and we'll, we'll continue to do that through this program, this behavior change piece is quite big as well. Uh, and it's just, in my mind, actually, it's just as an important point um, because it's just, this is just asking people to do things and encouraging them to do things, um, which are improving their health and well-being. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, um, we, we're reducing that impact on the network, um, delivering against our climate emergency targets, um, and we haven't actually got to actually do anything to just make these changes. It's just a case of people taking a different view. Um, if we move on, so next slide please, nice and thanks. Um, in terms of where we're doing this at the moment, um, as you can see, we have got some rural settings, Temple Cloud. Uh, so I, uh, I suspect that's not dissimilar, if I might suggest it, to, to the sort of um, the proposals that were coming forward for Timsbury, but other people will know better than I. Um, and also Whitchurch Village in Queen Charlton is another area that springs to mind. The rest, uh, as it says, are in Bath, Bath East and that kind of area. Um, but we are doing some in rural settings, so um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how those goes and uh, we'll keep you in touch with uh, perhaps with how those, uh, those work out. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. In terms of what we've achieved so far, um, back in autumn 2020, before I started on the programme, uh, we consulted on the strategy itself. Summer 2021, Joan was more about this than I, she was here at the time. Uh, we uh, uh, invited um, proposals or applications from, uh, from communities. 48 co came forward in that initial phase there. 15 were prioritised for this first phase that we're working on at this moment in time. Um, Joe, I think there was a second call, wasn't there, about August time? Yes, there was. So yeah. <clears throat> there was a round of applications that came in in August uh, 2021. Um, but by that point, um, sort of the 15 phase one areas had already yeah. been selected. But what um, we're thinking of with those August ones is to bring them forward into a second phase um, when we have the resource available to do so. Yeah, thanks for that. OK. Um, and then this is where the, the, the programme, in terms of getting the design development work done, and we start to move towards implementation schemes, starts to kick off really, winter 2021. We held an initial public engagement with those 15 areas to identify the kind of broad themes. So what was good about their area, what issues they experienced, and what they'd like to see improved. So give us a feel for what improvements people would like to see in those areas. Thanks, Alison. Next slide. 
So in terms of what we're doing now, over the summer, uh, residents have attended workshops uh, to help develop their livable neighbours. They've literally put forward ideas and identified potential solutions on maps. That's been a really interesting exercise. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say at the end of every one of the workshops, people have uh, clapped and been very pleased with the outcome of those workshops. Um, really, really good community engagement, actually. We've then gone back, uh, the way that we like to do things is to go back and check. So we've gone back and checked with in-person exhibitions, whether we've got, we've captured what people have said in those workshops correctly. Sometimes we haven't, and we've had to make some, some corrections. Um, not many, but we have made some. Um, uh, mostly we have made, got it right. And the other thing we've asked them to do is we've asked them to prioritize of all the things that people have said, what they would like to see coming forward. Um, we're now taking that work that people have done. Uh, we're layering across it um, uh, sort of critical success factors for the program um, to then get to a point where we have a short list that we can take forward to preliminary design. Um, and that's kind of the stage we're really at at the moment. Um, as I talked about earlier in terms of those lesser heard voices, we've also taken this sort of workshops on the road, uh, a visit to local groups who might find it more difficult to engage with those, uh, that workshop setting. Um, and so, for example, we've taken to schools, youth groups, lunch, lunch groups, all those sorts of those sorts of things. So engaging with younger and older people as well uh, and the less able, perhaps. OK, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so, as I just said, um, next stage is to do that prioritization exercise, come up with a short list of interventions. Uh, we'll then engage with the public again. Uh, and a really wide engagement exercise this next stage where we've got prelim preliminary designs, because that's a stage that we know from experience people can understand uh, and, and can really have input on. So we're going to go big on that next uh, level of engagement or the next piece of engagement. Um, and then we're into what I would call the final design, any statutory consultation that we've got to do um, before we move on to implementation. Um, so I think just at one point before moving on from this, this uh, what might be final slide, I can't quite remember, um, is that what we've done is we've built a process that builds consensus amongst communities as we've gone along the way. Um, it's not just been one, let, one bit of engagement or even two. We've spent time building that consensus and often that's needed. Uh, you know, these are, these are for communities sometimes big changes and that need, they need to be talked about and discussed um, and, and consensus needs to build. So that's been an important part of it and we've built that into the process. Uh, thanks, Alison. That is it. Um, that's kind of where we are. I hope that gives you sort of a bit of background on what Liverpool Neighbourhoods is about. Um, I appreciate we're not taking any forward in this area at the moment. Um, but I think it's useful to sort of explain what we are doing uh, for when it does come up and hopefully encourage some more applications to come forward when we're looking at that next phase of, of livable neighbourhoods. Thanks ever so much, Ron. OK, thank you, Ashley. Um, I can't see any hands up. I haven't got any information about it. If you wanted to say anything. Um, no. What I would say, bearing in mind I'm chairing this section of the meeting, so I need to be... Uh, correct have etiquette there is little in there for summer valley yeah i know um because even even the even the explosively traffic dense areas of the summer valley are relatively rural compared to bath central bath and as a londoner i know what it's living in the city is like mm. um i must say i'm concerned that baines is proposing to build a large trading estate out which will require access without any change to the buses or transport. And um, I'm very concerned that the A367 runs through Westfield and we have regularly two and a half mile traffic jams, yet the situation in Temple Cloud is seen as worse. Now, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm not entirely sure how you've assessed all this, but we will need to look at closely over the next few months. Yeah. Any other comments, anybody, please? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time, Andy and Mandy. Um, I now hand back to Linda. Go on the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ron. Right, so the next section is building resilience, and there are two parts to this. So, with the cost of everyday basics like petrol, energy, and food rising rapidly, these increases are affecting all households. So, 
Although the prices affect us all, they disproportionately impact those most vulnerable in our communities, and predominantly people on lower incomes will be hit harder than others. So local services such as the Citizens Advice Bureau and the Council's welfare support teams have already seen an increase financial help, including debt advice, access to food, helping with energy bills, and this is also felt across other services, such as mental health. Now, the council and other voluntary sector partners are working together to look at what um, support can be offered. So I'm going to uh, go over to Sarah now, and uh, she'll be able to tell you a lot more. Thanks, thanks, Linda. So we thought it would be really useful to um, share some of the progress we're making in terms of um, a coordinated approach in terms of the council and our voluntary partners. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that um, we're using our community wellbeing hub um, to direct um, people to access services such as um, the CAB, Bath Mind, um, access to food and other provisions. Um, and we're using that and actively promoting the community wellbeing hub so people have a one one stop shop of services directly and they've got an access to to support. Um, one of the other projects that we are looking at is around identifying warm places across the district. So um, these would be sort of non-judgmental places within the community to support people that where they could come and, and be and, and have access to support and, and provision of food and, and, and other activities. Um, so we're developing a project around that and developing a charter and working with organisations um, and voluntary groups around identifying some more places across the district. We're also looking at um, providing a, um, an engagement event for the voluntary sector on the 20th of October um, to promote some of the services um, and ensure that organisations are aware of what other services are out there to support people, looking right across the piece in terms of food provision, additional financial support, but also about help to um, improve the energy efficiency of people's homes. So we're looking at all of those elements. Um, and we're also looking at um, seeing whether we can in, um, enhance the access um, in terms of the community wellbeing hub, bringing in other services that will help um, in terms of we've recently um, um, added uh, our council's welfare support team, that those the, the team that support um, people on low incomes and on benefits with additional funding and support. So they're now a, a partner of the hub and you can directly refer into our welfare support team through, um, through the hub number. So there are a number of initiatives that are taking place. We'd like to talk to voluntary organisations and, and groups um, about um, warm places and whether they are able to provide and open up their spaces um, throughout the winter, um, as well as um, looking at food provision. Um, the Summer Valley in particular and Chew Valley in Canesham has a lack of food provision. We have food banks that are at capacity, but are there other options that we could provide in terms of other food clubs? and other food support for people locally. Um, so we're really keen to talk to people, talk to local groups, businesses and others about what support they can provide, uh, but keep that dialogue going and, um, and we'll come back and keep you updated with the coordinated approach that we're taking. Thank you, well, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, come back if anyone's got the info. Yeah, brilliant. So, uh, we move on to... Um, Daniel Node uh, from the emergency planning team. And uh, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, okay, that. right. So over to you then. Thank you, Linda. That's very kind. I think um, I have a presentation that uh, I don't know whether Sarah or Alison might be able to put up on the screen and then I'll talk through it and then let you know when um, you need to move along to another slide. Brilliant, fantastic. So for those that um, don't know me, my name is um, Daniel Node, and I uh, lead the emergency management team. So uh, we respond to incidents and emergencies. We did last week with the um, fire 
in um, Grove Street, the Rising Sun. So we provide accommodation, emergency accommodation for people that have been displaced. But what we are trying to do is um, trying to build resilience into uh, sort of communities to enable us to sort of um, pre-plan so we can make uh, communities more resilient in the event of an emergency. Um, so this is to support when we do need to respond that people are aware of their risks, understand the uh, vulnerable, uh, uh, you know, where places of safety are, uh, and also to be able to support the more vulnerable in our society. So um, if we go on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, our main strap line here in community resilience and, um, is that we want to empower individuals, households, businesses, community groups, and public organisations take responsibility for their own resilience. And I've heard with the previous uh, uh, presentation that supports this as well. So that's um, when the worst happens, all sections of our community have protected themselves and are enabled to support each other in a pre-planned way until life returns to normality. Now, um, you know, community resilience is very key to this. The emergency services come along, they deal with the um, issues and then they go again. So what we want to do is that if we've got community champions in areas uh, within our uh, communities, then they can be a key contact with the emergency services and provide useful information on risks, community members that are vulnerable, which will be really useful to the emergency services when they respond. But also we can then get an idea of how we can actually build on our recovery once the incident has been resolved. Then we can deal with the recovery, deal with, you know, deal with, uh, work with community groups to be able to support um, greater long-term um, resilience in emergencies and lessons learned that we can support communities as well. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so this um, is um, about um, a bit more about resilience communities. And um, what we're trying to do here is the hat here or the roof is the overall sort of strategy of what we want to do is the resilience uh, communities. What we want to do is make people more risk aware um, so they understand what risks are in their communities. And we'll come on to that in the next slide. We want people, so that's the first column as I go from left to right. Um, so we want to make people more risk aware what risks are in their communities. So we know, for example, Tube Magna, there's a risk of flooding through the fast responding um, uh, river there. And we know we've got pretty robust plans for what to do and resilience in regards to the uh, flood wardens and community works that we've done there previously. The second uh, column there, the green column, is um, about personal um, uh, resilience as well. So it's about some um, people themselves within their own households becoming more resilient and understanding what they need to do to do that. So um, they have their own grab bags, they have their own plans, they understand the risk, they know where evacuation areas are, they know where their place of safety. So it's really important that um, people understand uh, where they can get help, how they can actually plan for emergencies and support themselves. So they don't you know, in a way, they don't become another burden for the emergency services because they're more self-sufficient. The third column there is about vulnerable people in our communities. Um, when we've had recent is, uh, incidents, like Storm Eunice, um, we had a water leak at, um, a water, uh, water leak, a burst water main at Charlton Road near Canesham, where we were working with multi-agency partners on understanding who we needed to get to in the first uh, instance to support those vulnerable people within our communities. And to get that information was really hard. There's obviously uh, GDPR issues, DPA, but also um, what we want to do is if we've got those key contacts in communities, then we can obviously make sure that we can share that information adhering to the um, DPA legislation as well, which um, in most cases in emergencies we're allowed to share. But it's making sure we get to those vulnerable, vulnerable people first to enable them to be able to be supported. Um, and the fourth column there, business continuity, is to understand um, the organisations that are supporting us what are their continuity? How long can they keep going? Where can they get local resource from? And how can they can support the emergency services? So it's understanding, you know, how, how much resource we've got, because obviously it's finite as well. We can't, um, you know, uh, uh, rely on people to be going for hours and hours and hours. So it's enabling um, groups to have that support resource available that we can deal with short, medium, long term incidences. And we've got the right resource in place and the right uh, people to be able to provide that support, that, that um, information as we, as we go through the incident. And also it's other agencies that um, support as well. So the last column is the Avon and Somerset Local Resilience Forum. 
the local authority is a cap one responder and we work with our local authority uh sorry our emergency services colleagues to ensure that we have plans in place that um, enable us all to understand how we respond and that's mostly through the jessip uh, training that we do which is joint emergency services and optability um, principles which is we have a joint risk um, risk a situation we have a situational awareness and our plans are multi-agency between us all uh, next slide please okay so and one of the important steps here is to really understand the hazards on our community so we know and i'm going to go top right first that we have in the winter snow events and that caused issues with regards to vulnerable people um, and we've heard about warm places which is a great initiative to support people that might not be able to heat their warms uh, homes with the ongoing energy uh, crisis that we're all experiencing at the moment but also it's access as well and getting um, um, resources through to people that might be house banned as well and that's a really important thing as well so you know if we can build on that resilience and understand where people might you know who might need support then we can obviously direct those um, support uh, agencies that are able to support us to those people um, and bottom right we have flooding and I mentioned Shoe Magna that's an area where we have a risk and we support that community and work with uh, Lynn Easton and in, in, in developing plans, supporting the community uh, wardens, um, looking at community resilience days, which um, the two Magna have got coming up. And we've got those key contacts and we work together closely to make sure that we understand how the response might work and how those community champions within their communities can support us as well. Um, and we've got bottom left, which is power outage. Now we know we've had a lot of um, information through the press that possibly we're going to have um, you know power outages as we go through the winter so it's really again how we can support those communities in regards to those hazards so we're always looking at what hazards we have and what um, is new on the horizon as well and we work through with our local partners as i mentioned it in the last slide and local resilience forum to understand particularly winter planning and the top left we've got fuel as well because so many of us rely on fuels certainly rely on our cars to be able to get us around and that's also community uh, nurses and so on that support um, vulnerable people as well in community and they rely on their cars to get around and obviously support those people as well um, so it's about what we can do in pre-planning to ensure that we build some resilience there as well so next slide please uh, um, so what we're looking for in individual and families resilience is how we can prevent so as individual family members within our community we can work on prevention measures to make sure that we are aware of the risk and we prevent it which makes us more resilient then what can we protect how can we protect and that's really important and i think we sometimes rely on agencies the emergency services and so on to provide that level of protection but obviously if we're more resilient as individuals and family members it helps them as well we become less vulnerable um know how to respond have an individual plan know how to respond if there is you know if you're in a sort of floodplain or you um you know you need you need to evacuate the property know where you need to go so as emergency um, planners we work with um, the planning teams on evacuation plans for you know multiple um properties so hmos and so on to ensure that they have um, coherent flood plans and are able to evacuate areas to get to higher ground to support um and also prepare have your own grab bags at home that's really important as well so therefore if you are displaced and you need to go somewhere you can pick, quickly pick up a, a grab bag and um, within that slide you'll see that there's some um, some examples of what you need to put in your grab bag as well and I think those are really important I certainly have one at home to be able to pick up quickly if I need to if I'm displaced from my home um, next slide please um, and also what um, you know disasters of uh, and incidences and emergencies have told us over the years it's all about people you know people are affected by disasters and so on clearly property is as well but people are our main you know who we want to protect mainly and that's really an important bit of contingency planning and it's about reducing those accidents um, understanding sort of what illness and providing um, support to those people that um, do need uh, medication and so on and um, it's also about um, evacuation as well, how we can support those evacuations and make sure that people understand how to um, how to evacuate and how to develop plans as well. Um, and that's really key, but it is all about people. And this slide really is saying, this is what it is. It's about people and it's about providing that vulnerable support. Next slide, please. So um, this slide gives you an, uh, 
an idea of what we do in regards to uh, cross organizational working partnerships. Um, and we do a lot of this within the emergency planning team. And what we want to do is build on this in regards to incidences and community resilience. So um, I'm going to go right from the top there. So it's building social capital through bonding and bit of bridging. So encourage social interaction. We're trying to a lot of, you know, certainly around my community, people keep to themselves sometimes, but it's there's a lot of, um, you know, we have, um, I live in Lark Hall in Bath and we have this uh, new Oriel Hall and lots of community groups meet there and so on. So it's about encouraging that so people get to know the neighbours and build those social interactions. And we know from working with our emergency planning um, colleagues and also emergency services that once you get to know people, you understand how they respond, you know their strengths, weaknesses and so on. That's really important. Um, and then going to the right, building social capacity so communities are safer and more secure, uh, more tolerant and respectful, more democratic and transparent. So just make sure, you know, we know more about what's going on, how, you know, the infrastructure in our communities, and that is so transparent and communicated to people as well. Going down, supporting local businesses and local production as well, mutual support, cooperation. And also businesses as well, becoming businesses, local businesses, their business continuity plans that they can keep supplying um, local products to, produce to people and supporting. And, you know, they know vulnerable people as well and can support those vulnerable people within those communities and become self-sufficient and uh, having a disaster recovery plan and also supporting the local economy as well. Um, in the bottom and middle is sharing resource networking. There are great examples of um, Saltford um, Parish Council have done a great uh, bit of resilience work and we've been working alongside them and their um, resilience um, documentations are on their parish website and it's really good. They know where their place of safety is and they work clear, clear, uh, clearly and precisely and they work closely with us as well. Other organisations as well, which is understanding what police will do, how they will work um, and how um, your voluntary agencies such as Red Cross and so on can support, which we can, um, you know, come under the remit of the local authority as well. So it's understanding how they can support organisations within communities as well. Um, in the middle uh, left is focused on vulnerable, as I've been mentioned, transparency and joined up face to face customer contact across organisations to so providing face to face training on plan risk plans exercising. And again, top left is households becoming self-reliant, taking action for yourself and family, uh, which was mentioned in the last slide. And you can do, you know, however small it makes a difference, essentially. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how do we, uh, how are we going to communicate that? So we're working on a community, uh, a community resilience manual that we can um, provide to communities. Um, and also we're going to update our web page, which needs to be updated as well with all the information you need. Um, you know, following uh, the, a lot of the information on the slides that I've previously gone through will be included on the resilience page, but also some useful contacts and um, how you can get in touch with the emergency planning team as well. Warning and informing how you would warn and inform people within your communities of the risks, um, new people that come into the community, where their nearest place of safety is, whether that's the nearest community. Um, Hall and all the emergency services, and we know where that is as well, so we can work closely to warn and inform people where that those locations are. Promotion, how do we promote uh, promote that and publications so we can promote that maybe through um, parish magazines, making sure that the information is up to date and we get that information through to people to ensure that they know the details and how they can support each other. And that's also through channel and people networks. And that's really a question open to the floor is where can we get what people, you know, what channels, what networks can we use to be able to get that information through? And then it's tenor communication contact details. The most important thing is when I'm on call is who do I need to contact? So I know for Drew Magnan, and I've used that example quite often, I can call Lynn Easton and say, Lynn, what's the situation on the ground? Who do we need to support? Which teams, what services need to be on the ground? And we can support that way as well. Um, so next slide. Um, so what do we want to do? So what we want to do is create a, um, a, um, a sort of community resilience volunteers and contacts list uh, within those communities and we're going to use a template which I'll show in the next slide to gather that information so therefore we will have details what we want to know is the template so the template will create um, um, what the risks are within those communities what plans are in place to respond key contacts 
and um, what recovery needs to be considered for those particular locations. So what we want to do and what we're using these parish meetings to do is to go out and say, who are the key contacts that we can work with to start to develop these plans and then get it out to the get those plans out to the wider community uh, in the event of an emergency and an incident happening and obviously we know the incidences don't always happen nine to five monday to friday they'll work they'll come out of hours uh, weekends and when i got called um, for last week's fire it was four o'clock in the morning so we know you know can we get hold of people when it's antisocial hours and how can you know get through to those key people that are helping us to support so next slide again um just put a bit in here about how the template looks and you'll see um the heading there which is the you know it will have the templates uh, heading which would be community name so let's say um kingsham uh, parish council you know parish area parish council that'd be the community name the community emergency plan version data plan when the plan is going to be reviewed um, we'll have sort of key contacts, who's the coordinator, who's, um, you know, coordinating the information, deputy team member one, two, and we have those details. And then, for example, like a community club plan as well, so that we'll um, be able to pick up what's been happening, in, uh, you know, what are the risks in regards to flooding in the community, what are the risk areas, where do we need to respond to first, how do, or, you know, I have um, key uh, or community community people signed up to the environment uh, environment agencies for affording the system, which is brilliant and um, can really sort of give an idea of um, you know um, alerts, warnings, severe warnings within the area, which gives that pre um, information that you know that you need to act upon in regards to a flooding event. So we would help with that in regards to supporting communities with those key contacts in uh, writing community emergency plans. If we go to the next slide. Brilliant. So what we've done on the left hand side, is we've produced a poster which we can deliver to communities that gives uh, our key details and gives some information on what I've been um, uh, we're, you know, going through with the slides. So um, community, emergency, community con uh, emergency community contacts, prepare for emergency uh, and what you need. And then, um, you know, regarding uh, critical information in regards to pets and so on. And we'll provide key contact numbers through to the um, uh, you know, generic numbers through to the um, emergency services and us as well as Cat1 responders. Um, we will uh, also, as I mentioned before, we'll update our web page uh, with information as well, and we'll provide a P uh, PDF tem template of the post that you can see on the left hand side as well. And obviously, our emergency management team uh, generic um, uh, email is, is on, will be on that and also on our page as well. Um, okay, next time, please. Uh, so next step, so we want to, through uh, these meetings, identify community emergency contacts. We may already have that through Alison and Cyrus teams. We then want to work with those contacts to um, write and draft and develop emergency plans, um, using the templates. Um, those will then go to our emergency plan. We then, um, sorry, emergency team, emergency planning team. We then integrate that into communities, provide training, test it, plan it. Um, maybe for a tabletop exercise, which we did with Salford, um, so we can develop that through communities uh, as we work through the um, plans. And uh, next slide. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you for listening. Any any questions? I don't think we do have at the moment. So. But, oh yes, one new message, Eleanor. Absolutely, pets. Yeah, it's a really good question. And we had two dogs and two cats last week in an hour. Uh, we had 31 people displaced in the bar on Broad Street. So we did have to look after uh, two dogs and two cats, uh, which we did. Um, so we do have a plan to help. Uh, and the two dogs didn't actually get on with each other, which was, um, you know, quite... Uh, Quite amusing in some ways, but yes, we do have a um, pet um, a pet plan within our rest centre plan, so we do that here, and also a feeding plan as well, which we support people. Uh, and last week, people were evacuating without any, um, you know, they were evacuated with their pajamas um, because they were evacuated quickly. So we provide emergency uh, clothing as well. So that's all within our rest centre plan. But I think it's key to say that 
Um, we do have a network of places of safety, um, which we can use to set up should there be an incident, and we communicate that to our emergency services colleagues as well. In the event of an incident, we can use the place of safety and we keep in contact with those um, key holders as well. But I think the key thing out of this is to work with key contacts within your community. You can develop the plan and then communicate that out to members of the, uh, the communities. Thank you. Well, and the other related question is um, what to do with wounded wildlife. Um, there is a chair of a local parish council who spent about six hours trying to get help when a deer was hit by a car in her lane. Can you include information on what to do? Well, in the case of my son, if a corn snake pops out of your toilet. The police didn't want to know. Absolutely. So we do. But, you know, to have the information, this is the RSPCA. Um, or I caught a ferret once, uh, but you don't know what to do with a ferret in your back garden. <laughs> uh, seriously, to have some solid wildlife information, I think, would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good question. So, um, Yes, we do. Um, so we coordinate country um, agencies in, this, in, in response to an incident. That's Red Cross, Samaritan, and so on. And the RSPCA are part of those um, um, voluntary agencies as well. So we have those key contacts that we can call should we need to uh, be supported by, um, by those experts, because clearly we don't have that expertise. Ron. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay, Ron. Yeah, okay. Um, Daniel, I, I've been to lots of these meetings as a, as a vice chair, and I haven't been moved to silence before, but uh, your presentations absolutely staggered me. It contains so many things that I hadn't even started to think about and probably wouldn't want to because it would keep me light awake at night. But it's good food for thought, um, and um, to be prepared is always the answer nowadays. Um, I, don't th I think Eleanor's love of wildlife is well known, uh, but you're not really the, the third emergency service as such, are you? So, no. um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, the more information you can feed down to parishes to distribute around youth clubs and church halls and that kind of thing, I think would be the best. So, um, Best of luck with your work, and uh, we're glad we've got you. Thanks, Ron. And I think that's a really important point. Um, and I think what we found through Storm Eunice is that um, there was a multi-agency call with emergency services colleagues and um, us as well, and we're Western Power Distribution as well. And Western Power Distribution were giving details of um, power outages within communities within the Bath and North East Somerset area that were quite astounding. We were saying, my God, we've got a real issue here. There's lots of um, households here without uh, power. There's over a thousand properties in, I forget where it was now, it was out towards East Hartree. And um, we thought, right, we've got a real issue here. But actually when we contacted um, one of the community resilient um, or re agents on the grounds uh, through Alison and Sarah's team, we found that wasn't the case. That wasn't the, um, their information was wrong essentially. But if we'd taken Western Power Distribution's um, information as read, we would have um, stood up so many people, so many resources that weren't needed. So the idea of these plans is to be able to contact those community uh, champions within the areas or coordinators, where we can really get that on the ground information, which was so valuable to us at the time. Otherwise, we go off in different, we may put resources into areas, where we just don't need to put those resources. So I think it's really key and there's key contacts that know their areas and we can start to develop those emergency plans. So I think that's a really good point, um, uh, Ron. Well, oh, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? I'm looking around the screen, but I can't see anyone else. So thank you very much indeed. In fact, I would like to say thank you to all the people who've come and spoken tonight. It's been really interesting and uh, something that the forum can do very well with. So that's brilliant. Right, so um, the next section, which is about the AGM, um, we need 
to agree the notes of the previous AGM meeting, which was held on the 7th of December 2021, which were sent out at the time. They were? Yes, and we didn't have any queries coming back. No, unless uh, anybody has any queries? No. Okay, so we'll note those. And the chair's annual review, which again was circulated with the papers. Does anyone? No, okay. So um, we haven't had any requests um, for the terms of reference to be amended or updated. So they will stay the same. And I now hand over to Sarah for the election of the chair and vice chairs. Thanks, Linda. Um, so just before um, we go into voting um, for the chair and vice chair, are there any last nominations before we go into the final vote? No, okay. So um, Linda and Ron have both said they would be happy to stand uh, Linda as chair again for another year and Ron as vice chair. So if you're all happy, we're just gonna do that as a show of hands, if that's okay. Um, we can do that either virtually or you can raise your hand if that's okay. So are you all happy as a group to um, uh, for Ron and Linda to remain in their positions um, for the next year going forward? I'll, yeah, so I'll take that as a majority vote. That's great. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Linda then. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, doke. Well, we've got um, um, details of Bain's budget engagement and dates for the 2023 forums, um, which we're trying to sort out at the moment because, you know, we're all so frantic, aren't we? So trying to organise dates that fit in with everybody. So at the moment, that's the main job for Sarah and Alison because they do all of that. So um, it, at the end of the AGM, I'd like to say thank you for allowing Ron and myself to continue for another year. And a very big thank you, a very big thank you to Alison and Sarah for all they do for the forum. Where would we be without them? And I so desperately mean that. I don't know where I'd be. So thank you. And good night, everyone.